Well, we're talking today about victory over guilt. And I want to begin today with the reading of the scriptures. And uh, I hope you have found in your Bible, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 32. If not, you can be looking for it right now. Psalm 32, a psalm of David. And in a moment we'll stand and I'll read verses 1 through 5. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, those times and places where, by your Holy Spirit, your word just speaks so clearly about your intent and what you are able and willing to do in our lives. You are willing to forgive. And we need it. And so, God, we come to your word today, and we want to hear from your Holy Spirit speaking individually to our hearts according to our individual need. And, and Lord, we know you can do that. We, we pray that you will. And that having heard from you, we will respond in faith and in obedience that our lives might be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Edgar Allan Poe's classic tale, The Telltale Heart, he tells the tale of a man who has committed a murder, who then hides the dead man's body beneath the floorboards in the victim's house. The murderer is present in the house when the police arrive to interrogate him and conduct their investigation. At first, he is smug and confident. He's such a fine actor. He can carry off this evil charade. The police will never suspect him. And then, faintly at first, but very real, he begins to hear the sound of a heartbeat in the room. The victim is not dead after all, but lives. He begins to panic. The heartbeat grows louder and, and stronger. He will surely be found out. It, it pounds and pounds. What's wrong with these fools? Are they deaf? Can they not hear it? It seems so loud to him. Are they mocking him, pretending not to hear it? How can they not? It is almost deafening. The pounding, pounding, pounding of the heart. And at last, when he can stand it no more, he cries out, confessing his crime, pulls up the floorboards to reveal his trapped victim who lies quite still and very dead. The pounding heartbeat, the telltale heart, was his own. Consumed by his own guilt, the man confessed 
to his crime. Well, we all face guilt. Have you ever felt deep remorse for something that you've done that was wrong? I mean, have you ever said to yourself, I feel so guilty? Well, of course you have. Because we all face the problem of guilt. The New Testament speaks often about a person's conscience. I recently looked up the word conscience in a modern dictionary. I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised to find that your conscience is that part of your superego that judges the ethical nature of your actions and then transmits those determinations to your ego for consideration. Funny, but I always thought that your conscience was that God-installed part of your soul that tells you right from wrong. Amen. I still think that's what it is. Your God-created soul, your inner heart that tells you what is right and what is wrong. And because you are a soul with a conscience and you do things from time to time that you know in your heart you should not do, you experience the result and we call that guilt. Think of it this way. On the dashboard of my car, I have a check engine light. And that light exists as a warning device. If I have a problem inside the engine that is picked up by the computer system in the car, that check engine light glows bright yellow. And what it's saying to me is, hey, Jim, there's a problem here under the hood, and if you don't see about it real soon, things are going to get serious here. If you don't fix the problem, there's going to be trouble. And your conscience does the same thing. When your conscience starts bothering you, it's saying, You've got a serious attitude or you've got a serious behavior problem. You could have some real trouble here. Fix it right away or things are going to get a lot worse real fast. Guilt is a good thing initially. It is a warning to fix the problem now before things get a lot worse. And of course, the root problem behind all guilt and the resulting guilty conscience is that little three-letter word that all preachers love to talk about. The culprit behind a guilty conscience is sin. Sin is any evil thought, any impure motive, any selfish desire, any harmful action, anything that violates the expressed will of God for your life and breaks your fellowship with him. All of us, the Bible says very clearly, are sinners. All have sinned and missed the mark. We fall short of the glory of God. There is none that is righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Romans chapter 3. And so God tells us in our conscience and by the Holy Spirit that in light of his glory, we are guilty of sin. We are as guilty as sin. But now, again, guilt is a good thing. At first. It's an early warning system. It tells us, fix the problem that's being caused by the guilt. 
It's installed in our hearts to drive us to God for forgiveness and cleansing and complete restoration. The problem that so many people face, though, is not this temporary pang of guilt, but the pain and anguish of dealing with long-term unresolved guilt. If we do not consistently and immediately deal with guilt and we leave it go for a long time, we can build up and build up a truckload of unresolved guilt. Unresolved guilt causes all kinds of pain and emotional problems that keep us from experiencing the freedom that we can have in Christ. The human heart is a delicate mechanism. Small problems left unresolved can cause emotional, physical, spiritual problems. Of all the problems that plague people today, guilt is one of the most pernicious and persistent. Every pastor knows that in almost every counseling situation, unresolved guilt is going to be a major problem. But before we go much farther, I want to distinguish between two kinds of guilt. Let's call them real guilt and perceived guilt. Both are quite common and both are just as damaging. By real guilt, I mean... That when a person sins, they break God's law, they go contrary to his revealed will, and so they are guilty. They're convicted of their sin, but they do nothing about it. They swallow it, they eternalize it, they try to forget about it, but it stays down in their system and it works on them and it won't go away. It keeps raising its ugly head, a constant reminder of our unrighteousness. And it can make you miserable. It can destroy your confidence, your self-worth. It can warp your personality. It can make you physically sick. It can lead to depression and it can lead to all kinds of mental issues. Evangelist John Wesley White was told by doctors in Great Britain that upwards of 95% of all the patients in their mental wards have problems of unresolved guilt. David, the king of Israel, is a perfect example of a man who suffered from real Unresolved guilt. He entered into an adulterous relationship with his neighbor's wife, Bathsheba. He committed sin. When she became pregnant with his child, he conspired to hide the situation by bringing her husband Uriah home from the battlefield, trying to get Uriah to go home and sleep with his wife. But Uriah was a faithful soldier who would not go home and enjoy his wife's company while the Ark of the Covenant was in the field of battle. So when David's plan didn't work in desperation, he sends Uriah back to the front carrying orders for Joab, the commander, to leave Uriah unprotected on the battlefield where he'll be cut down and killed. So David has an adulterous affair and then murders off the husband. And he doesn't confess his sin to God, but he takes this new widow into his household and the months go by and this guilt is destroying him. 
He says in our psalm today, when I declared not my sin, that is when I was still hiding it, when I was living in guilt, my body was wasting away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, God, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. His unresolved guilt was killing him. Not only did it keep him out of touch with God, unable to enjoy any peace, any fellowship, but it made him physically sick and weak. Guilt can break your heart, it can break your spirit, it can eventually destroy your life. But there's also another kind of guilt that I refer to that I'm calling perceived guilt. This is the perception of guilt that a person assumes when no actual wrongdoing has taken place. Let's say that a child is raised in a dysfunctional home with overbearing parents who mistreat the child. Often abused children are made to feel guilty for imaginary offenses. Often guilt is imputed upon them. They're told that they are responsible for their ill treatment. That they deserve it because they're bad children. So cruel parents are quite good at making children feel guilty, carrying the weight of feeling responsible for crimes that they have never committed. Let's say that a child comes from a broken home. Parents divorced when the child was 12. Now, maybe the divorce was bitter and left some scars. Do you know that many, many times children assume that they are to blame for their parents' problems? They engage in what's called magical thinking. If I had only been a better child, then my parents wouldn't have split up. And they grow up with perceived guilt for things that they were not responsible for and had no control over. One more situation. A couple is married for 20 years, and one day the husband comes home and announces that he's found another woman. Divorce proceedings began. Now, they may not have been a perfect couple, but she never saw it coming. The husband has sinned, but the wife is left with this gnawing feeling that she is somehow to blame and she is tortured by perceived guilt when, in fact, there is little or none at all. What I want you to see today is that whether it's real guilt, guilt that you truly earned and deserved, or whether it's perceived guilt, guilt that was imputed on you by others for crimes that you never committed, they, ha they affect your heart and your spirit and are equally damaging. Even perceived guilt can affect a person's health and their relationship with God. A person who lives in guilt refuses to accept the grace of God and often has his or, own or her own problems with forgiveness. People who struggle with guilt carry grudges and nurse resentments because they cannot accept forgiveness. They often become bitter and judgmental and they won't grant forgiveness to others. And so the problem just compounds itself. Both kinds of guilt need to be dealt with if fellowship with God, peace of mind, and physical health is to be restored. 
So we're going to look at victory over guilt. What I need to tell you today is how to win the victory over guilt. And there are three simple steps that you can follow which can set you free from the burden of guilt and keep you free from carrying it forever. Number one, you must accept that complete forgiveness is the key to being rid of all guilt. Complete forgiveness is the key to being rid of all guilt. And complete forgiveness is available from God and made possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is the removal of the stain of sin and the eternal payment for sin. While we may have to face the consequences for our sin in this life, through forgiveness, God will wipe our eternal record clean and keep us in a right standing with him. If you commit a sin, let's say by lying to and betraying a friend, you feel guilty because you are guilty. You may pay the consequences. You lose that friend. And you may have to work hard at restoring trust and confidence again. You may get that friend back. You may not. But if you go to God with your sin and you confess it and you repent of it, and you ask for forgiveness for the sin, God can assure you that he has forgiven you, he has wiped that sin off your record, and that you are in right relationship with him. And then God may help you get that friend back. Forgiveness from sin is why Jesus came to die on the cross. Essentially, it's the core of salvation. Forgive, salvation is forgiveness and the cleansing of sin. That's the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves you and wants to live in a close personal relationship with you, reveal his plan for your life, giving you a fulfilling purposeful, abundant life, and he also wants you to live with him in heaven for eternity. But this righteous, holy God cannot abide sin in his presence. And we're a fallen, sinful bunch. Every one of us. We all sin and we're all guilty. None of us can experience abundant life and none of us can resolve the problem of our own sinfulness. It is not up to us to forgive ourselves. It is up to God to forgive us. Therefore, we cannot save ourselves. We need a savior, someone to secure our forgiveness for us. And that's why Jesus came. He who knew no sin, Paul says, became sin, became our sin, so that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. Jesus died on the cross. God took my sin, your sin, all our guilt, and laid it on his son. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that when we repent, when we in godly sorrow for our sin turn from it and turn to Jesus Christ and allow his death on Calvary's cross to count for us, God in his love and mercy is pleased to allow the shed blood of his son to cover all our sins. When we confess our sins, God is ready and waiting to save us, forgive us, cleanse us, and restore us to a right relationship with him. If we say we have no sin, John writes, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, but I love those words, all unrighteousness. God's forgiveness is complete. So if you have never accepted Christ as Savior, that's the necessary first step in receiving forgiveness and cleansing. Turn from your sin... Admit that you need a Savior. Trust Christ and receive him into your heart. If you're already a Christian, you need to trust that when God said that he was ready and willing to forgive you and cleanse you, he meant it. And you just need to sincerely repent and ask for his mercy. Forgiveness and complete cleansing from all guilt and from every sin is immediately available through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, secondly, I want you to know something about God's divine forgetfulness. And that is that when God forgives, God forgets. When somebody hurts us, when somebody sins against us, we may say that we forgive, but we almost never forget. God is not like that. The Bible says when God forgives, God forgets. Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor has he rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then Jeremiah 31, here it is. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. I like the fact that God says, I will remember. I'd hate to think that there would come a time when I should stand before God and he would say to me, I'm really sorry about this, but something has come up. <coughs> now, there's this thing that apparently I forgot. No, God remembers. But in regard to our sin, he has determined 
that he will never hold it against us. He will never remind us of it. He will never bring it up again. I will remember their sin, he said, but I will remember their sin no more. When God forgives, that's the end of it. It's gone, paid for, forgiven, remembered no more. Third and most importantly, you must accept God's forgiveness by faith. You must accept God's forgiveness by faith. Now let me ask you something. How long do you remember a paid bill? Right? Once you've paid the bill, you forget it, right? God said that the death of Christ paid your bill for sin. Once it's paid, he forgets it. And he never reminds you of it. Now, if God has paid the bill for your sin with the blood of his son, and he is willing to forget it, you need to forget it too. You need to stand firm in the forgiveness that Christ has paid for and receive his cleansing and enjoy it, accept God's forgiveness, and then walk in it by faith. If God forgets our sins as soon as he forgives us, then why are we still tormented by a guilty conscience? It is because we refuse to accept his forgiveness or we are reminded of our sins by Satan who wants us to live in doubt and in defeat. He is the one who causes people to say, God could never forgive that horrible thing that I did. That's not the Holy Spirit talking to you. That's the devil. God is not in the tormenting business. Once we've repented, once we've confessed our sin, once we've accepted God's forgiveness and believe that when he forgives, he forgets, we can stand tall and call Satan a liar when he suggests that God didn't or couldn't forgive us. God has forgiven you and accepts you as though you have never sinned. If you've come to Christ, if you've repented and confessed your sin, You say, but you don't know that horrible thing that I did. It doesn't matter. God forgives and forgets. He took that sin and he laid it on Jesus. And now he accepts you in him. For your own mental and spiritual health, drop that load of guilt at the cross and leave it there. In John Bunyan's classic tale, The Pilgrim's Progress, he tells the story of Christian's journey from the town of destruction to the celestial city. It is a parable of every Christian's life and journey. And as the pilgrim, Christian, begins his journey, he is all bent over from this terrible weight on his back. It is a bundle of guilt from a life of sin. And he meets a man whose name is Evangelist. An evangelist points him toward yonder light and a narrow gate. And as he enters through the narrow gate of faith, he continues his journey. He comes upon a hill. And as his eyes look up, he sees a cross. And he's able to look up a little further. 
and he sees Jesus on that cross. And as his eyes follow upward toward looking at Jesus, he's aware of the fact that really for the first time he is able to stand erect as he looks into the face of Christ in this tremendous weight of guilt that he's been carrying that's had him all bent over has fallen off of his back and rolled down the hill and into an empty tomb. Leave your guilt in the tomb of Jesus where it belongs. Accept that complete forgiveness and cleansing is available through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Confess your sin and your guilt and accept that when God forgives, he forgets. Reject any haunting memory of guilt as an attack of the enemy and stand in the promise of forgiveness and that is winning the victory over guilt. Let's, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the forgiveness that is available to us in Christ. Thank you, God for his salvation. Thank you, Lord. That we don't have to live in guilt and recrimination and we don't have to live separated from you. But we can come and confess and repent. That's our part. But then you abundantly forgive and pardon and restore. I pray if there's anyone here today who's been carrying their load of guilt, that they will come and they will leave it at the foot of the cross today. And accept and receive your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that when you've forgiven us, that bill is paid. And so you forget about it, so can we. And we don't have to live lives dominated by guilt. I pray, God, that by your Holy Spirit, you're going to be healing hearts in this room today. Helping us to live lives of restoration. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.